touching my beard. Okay. Uh, looks like we're almost live. Uh, Mal told me to st don't don't touch my face. It's a COVID thing. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome back to the live stream. Uh, hope you're all well. I'm just making sure everything's connected up because you know, just keeping it all organised. Bear with us. Got to get this part right, otherwise I, I get uh, I'll get some grumpy comments, and justifiably so. Spam that out. That's funny. I know I'm live. It's all right, guys. I know I'm live. I'm just uh, I'm just making sure that all the um, names and uh, ah, here we go. Kyle, good to see you, mate. Hope you're well. Uh, Adrian, Seamus, Steve, everyone tuning in. Thank you so much. This is great. Uh, Jim, Hayden, uh, everyone who's tuning in. Thank you so much. My name is Matt Bailey. I'm the National Ambassador here for the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society in Australia. Joining you still in isolation, joining you in a chance for to talk with people about whiskey journeys, to, for us to have a dram, for us to uh, get together digitally at the very least, uh, hopefully in person soon. It'll be, we'll all be getting back together in bars and restaurants and all over the place in due course. And I think maybe hugs and handshakes will come later on, but we're all going to be there. And it's, and this is part of it is just getting together and having a chat each night. For those who don't know, if I've not said it enough times already, we go live every single day. This is really exciting. It's seven o'clock every single day. It's been every single day for about a year now. And I really appreciate um, everyone tuning in. Tonight is a special guest. And I say that every night but it is true every night it's special guest can i please welcome julian white the co-founder of whiskey and ailment jules hey how you going good to, on. here we good are to be, good to be here and uh you know i see uh, i see the society um facebook uh posts about the uh, about the lives every day and you know incredible uh range of people that you've had uh, up on the uh, up on the feed here so i know i feel like i'm in uh, incredible company thank you yeah, I appreciate that. Oh, my lighting's a bit out. Oh, there we go. Um, no, I appreciate that. It's 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 a great chance for us to, like I say, get together and have a chat with people, and especially with someone like yourself who's had such a, uh, a what's the right word for it, a, a rich history with the society and with um, in, and working a whiskey bar and and changing the whiskey scene in Australia, which I want to talk a bit about more in general. Um, Hayden already says uh, I see a sixty-eight dot one eight lurking there. Yes, I think we're going to get to that. I think that's uh, that's that's on the plan. Uh, you got what have you got in front of you there? Just so we, so we, because people always ask, what are we dramming? And I always forget. So um, I'm dramming tonight on um, some particularly fun bottles here. Um, the 6818, obviously the uh, triple berry lamington cake, which was uh, arranged for us um, last year um, to celebrate five years of partnership uh, with the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society. Year before. Four. I think it's I think it's 2018 that we did that one with you guys. All right, time's flying, ain't it? Time flies. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, that's uh, one of our one of our favourites, and uh, I've still got. I think we've still got a, a, a case or so sitting around at the bar, and we'll just slowly be uh, dribbling that out over the years to come. Um, then uh, I've got uh, another one of mine. I think the actual, actually the society was one of the. Um, companies, I suppose you could say, that, that really got me uh, interested even more in, into what uh, a maniac can be. Um, and so, um, yeah, this is A5.1, um, an incredible um, dram that uh, is just about finished, actually. I don't know if you can see that, but it's, it's almost out. I've been, uh, I've been sort of savouring it. We, interestingly, we don't keep a lot of whiskey at home. Um, I only live like 10 minutes walk away from the bar. And uh, so there's always drams at hand. Or a fifteen minute stumble if it comes to it. Right, right. If if needs oh. be. Yeah. The the takeaway joints are not in the right place though, I might add. <laughs> you kinda need that you kinda need that like um, you know, that perfect kebab shop between your house and and uh, and whiskey and almond almost, don't you? <laughs> right. Maybe that's why I'm so thin still. Um, <laughs> And then uh, I haven't, I just literally ripped the seal off this before um, the, uh, the lovely um, Overeem's um, Sawfords have uh, sent us this bottle um, just recently um, to 
to say congratulations for the 10th anniversary of the bar. Um, this is an Overeem sherry cask, but it is a pretty special one. It's, I don't know if you can see that, OHD 77. That goes back a bit. Yeah, and I, uh, I mean, there were in the message that was sent to us, there was no mention uh, of, of of the fact that it was, uh, you know, cask seventy seven. I just sort of had a look at it and went, "Oh, hello, that's early." Um, and I said to Jane, "What's going on here?" And she said, "Oh, that's one that Dad keeps under the house." And uh, <laughs> so yeah, I'll uh, I'll be yeah. a sip of that to get me started. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, just to because I, as I said, we always get asked in the stream. Um, what we're driving on. So I, I'm, I was inspired by your message before about you're going to start, well, you, well, you had not start with, but you had an Armagnac lined up. So I've gone with A4.5. Uh, a Cup of Kindness is the name on that one. Um, and as, as our members know, the A4s are some of the, some favorites there. Faye Cool joined in, Joss Taylor, Dave Phillips, Samuel Licardi, Brendan Osmers, Emma Gilligan, Ali Barner, Darren Howie, all the, all the familiar names and faces. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. I'm going to pour myself a little bit of that Armagnac. And I've also got on the table here your, your special collaboration with Flurio. Yeah, cool. Nice one. Thank you. So you guys have done some, you guys have done like the, some collaborations with a few Australian whiskeys now. Yeah. Um, for memory, uh, we've done three. Three, uh, yeah. Yeah. So we've I'm about did... to say two, but I, I, I knew it was three. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so the first one we did was with uh, the Lark Distillery. I think we went down there in 2013, perhaps. Um, with our staff um, and uh, we filled a 20 litre um, sepults cask uh, with, with new make uh, and then visited it for uh, the next year and then the preceding year to that we, um, we, we, we uh, elected to bottle it and it was absolutely gorgeous. The only problem with the 20 litre cask at cask strength uh, from Tassie is you, yeah, you only get about 30 bottles out of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but it was gorgeous. So that was a great start to uh, what became more of the collaborations with uh, whiskey distillers around Australia. So uh, a couple of years ago, we did one with Sullivan's Cove, the double cask blend, and uh, which was a huge success. And also uh, now with Flurio, uh, mm. we've done uh, this one for primarily for use for the Australian whiskey uh, masterclass. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we have been selling that reasonably widely as well. Yeah, I remember it was a bit tricky to get it first. I, I, um, I, you very graciously sold one to me. That I was like, it was, it was intended for the master classes, not for, not for, right. just, yeah, right. not for bottle sales. But I, I'm, I'm very glad to have one. I'll pr probably crack that later on. Um, there's a question actually. Well, while we're talking about uh, whiskey and Almond and SMWS, Hayden Dare asks because I, you referenced the 68.18. Uh, are there any more SMWS and whiskey and Almond partnerships in the pipeline? Jules, I'm going to let you answer that one. Sure. Um, yeah, there, there are more in the pipeline. Uh, they're not too far away either. Um, so yeah, stay tuned. Um, I've been, uh, so lucky, uh, and Brooke's been so lucky to be offered more opportunities to, to work on casks with the society. So, um, yeah, there's another one coming. Yeah. It's uh, exciting. We've, 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 we've kept the wraps on it obviously for a while because it's, it's still in, in, uh, in development is the best phrase I can give it to it. And it's still on its way which is really exciting, but we, we presented a, a number of samples that we're able to chew through and, and pick one out, which has been great. And those are the keen eye actually, who've been watching my live streams. And I just realized this, I've had people make mention of that book, which just says drink more whiskey on the cover. And I've had others make mention of the butane torch up there as well. But in between those are some sample bottles, which may have been some of the samples that were assessed for the whiskey and helmet cask. So there's, there's something, there's something in the pipeline, which we're um, working on, which is very, very exciting. Darren says evening all. Okay. So, uh, let's, let's dig in some of the questions I wanted to get into tonight. Um, so I want to just first start by letting those watching know, uh, like your history with it all, you and you and Brooke and your history with it all, starting with Shea Regine into Whiskey and Ailment and what the last 10 years has looked like, how it came about to begin with even before, like how even Shea Regine came about. Um, so Brooke's family has always been in, um, in small, small family businesses and they've always, you know, included the whole family in that business. Um, so it was really Brooke's desire and ability to be able to, you know, put together a business plan to, to get a bar started. Um, and, uh, we were good mates at the time working, um, at a, at a, I suppose you could call it a nightclub in, in Melbourne, um, together. Um, and we both really respected the way each other, 
uh, worked and what our values were for uh, food and drink. And so um, I was a natural employee, so to speak. Um, and um, yeah, we, uh, Brooke, I don't think she's still got it in her wallet. Um, the, uh, the, the newspaper clipping, when you used to buy businesses out of newspaper clippings um, to, to, to purchase the venue that was uh, at the space at 270 Russell Street. Um, and so, um, yeah, I mean, it was really down to, to Brooke and her family for, for, for getting that first hurdle, um, you know, down. And uh, really, at the time, I was mostly an employee. So um, after uh, the first sort of like six months um, of, of being of working there solely alongside Brooke. Um, we, uh, we really thought we're, we've got to have more of a focus here. What's our focus going to be? And we'd, we'd, we'd been attending the, uh, the Melbourne Rum Club um, quite a bit and having that sort of focus um, really uh, like intrigued me. I, I'm someone that loves, loves the details, loves the nuances and, and, and loves that sort of nitty gritty if you want. Um, and I'm a bit of a luxury goods hound as well. So maybe that's got a bit of an issue with it, but- um, a, a few okay. Rolexes and a few sort of nice whiskeys and stuff and you're happy. Uh, maybe not, but yeah, <laughs> I appreciate them. Doesn't mean I have them, yeah. I get it, I get it. <laughs> Appreciation though, yeah. Yeah, so um, anyway, um, yeah, we really made the, the big leap, I suppose, to say, well, let's become a whiskey bar. And uh, one, of my, one of my favorite quotes that I've made up for myself is that, I, and I still remember the day vividly um, walking across Burke Street um, and, and uh, Greg Sanderson was crossing, um, crossing uh, us as well. And, um, and he said, oh, how's it going, guys? How's the new bar going? He worked for Diageo at the time um, and said, uh, you know, don't worry, it'll be fine, it'll be fine. Just every time you've got enough money, buy a new bottle and put it on the back bar. And um, that's what we did. Like, it just took that seriously to heart, put a new bottle on the back bar. Um, and uh, that turned into two new bottles on the back bar every every time we could afford it. He's a very uh, he's a very savvy operator, Greg. And for those who are watching who don't know, Greg Sanderson is uh, one of the co-founders or co-owners uh, of um, Speakeasy Group, which includes Mjolnir and Boilermaker House and a few other, ven and Nick and Nora's among others. So yeah, very, very sound advice even then. Yeah, totally. Um, so that really sort of got things moving um, for us, um, just having those new products and that having new products and introducing um, the new whiskies to the bar has become um, probably the most important thing um, for us moving forward. Um, and I think it's probably due to our success and also probably due to the success of the society as well is that is having new, new products um, all the time. Yeah, so many new whiskeys each month that we're able to offer up. Yeah. Um, it's actually, yeah. it's, it's funny that I think I found as close as possible to the date that um, uh, Whiskey Endowment partnered with the SMWS and it was around March 2013. Yeah. It, that's as close as I can get to the actual date that it was. Uh, it predates me just a little bit. I'm going to sh share my screen for a moment for everyone to see uh, a little bit of um, a little bit of history here. Uh, if we have a look. Uh, here we go. Can everyone see that? Yep. So there's the triple berry, of course, that uh, that was just being chatted about. I thought I'd just have a nice close-up photo, a bit of a stylized photo of the actual summer of the Lamington in there. And then uh, this is a great little photo here from 2013 of when uh, Georgie Bell, who's now with Bacardi, um, was the SNWS ambassador at the time. And uh, and that's and that's her in her um, serving up some 125.66, it looks like in some society branded Glen cans. And there's a, you can see there's a bit of a, um, it's like a cabinet sort of thing up here. So there's some, it's only have a slight cosmetic changes. And of course there you can spot jewels in the background there. <laughs> you haven't aged a day just by the way, that was seven years ago, that photo. <laughs> yeah, I look, I look back on some photos of myself and just go, wow. I, <laughs> you haven't changed a bit yet. How boring. <laughs> no, no, it's good. It's good. God, you you look the same when you're 60 or 80. It's fine. <laughs> so in that era, though, I mean, talking about some of that era, early era of uh, of what's what's best described as sort of whiskey appreciation and building that scene. A, did you ever think that this would be something that you were doing? Like, did you ever set out to create a whiskey appreciation scene in Melbourne as we know it today? Uh, look, I'm a stayer. Um, yeah. I've always known that about myself. I. I 
I, I, I don't like, like quitting on things. I'll, I'll stay there until it's finished. Um, I don't know if you've ever played a game like Sim City or The Sims or Sim Isle or one of those I, games. I they're, have, yeah. They're never ending, right? You can't win. Um, I yeah. love those that you can just continue to tweak with it and um, they're infinite. So, I might going to challenge you in Sim City then. I mean, I, I know I'm going to lose. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll outlast. That's the thing. Yeah. You outlast. No, I get that. It's, a, it's quite, a, um, it's quite a, I guess, a successful mindset for it. It's just it's it's persistence. It, it's the it's the water that cuts through the rock kind of idea. It's persistence rather than uh, yeah anything else. It's hundred percent. And like if you're making whiskey, you've got to have the same mindset to be honest with you because it, it takes a bloody long time. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think that's that's probably the thing that's really resonated for me and and, and why why we want to keep doing it is because I've just always want to um, upgrade and update mm. and you know, just polish that a little bit more, tweak that a little bit more. Uh, and there might not be monumental changes all the time, but yeah, uh, always looking for the next best. Yeah. I've, I've always felt like the changes at your bar have always been, uh, they've always been, uh, for you and Brooke, they've always been sort of like uh, incremental, but but meaningful, if that makes sense. It's kind of like little changes here and there, but have, that have created the sum of the whole rather than, well, this isn't working. So let's quickly pivot to this and, it's never. It's never, It's about maintaining, like you say, a persistent, a persistent mindset on it. Hmm. Yeah. So that's. Yeah. That's that. Um, yeah. So in that era, though, I mean, what the beginnings? Of, I'm gonna if, tell me if I'm getting this wrong. There was that. There were meetups called Whiskey Business. Is that right? No, we had the Single Malt Collective. Single Malt uh, Collective. Sorry, I'm getting. I, I knew I was getting my wires crossed there. Um, which um, some, some of the customers which originally came to the Single Malt Collective. Um, are still customers with us today and we, we had a sign-in book um, that we still have um, from those first few single malt collectives and they were based loosely off um, the, the the format of Rum Club um, and, and and that was really what started to just build a bit of a community of people that that came in um, you know on a regular basis to learn about about whiskey and and and, and to try something um, affordably and um, just make it less of a of a hostile and um highbrow product because in melbourne in 2011 um buying a, a glass of glenfiddich 12 year old at, at a pub was something that probably cost you between 12 and 15 dollars and that's in 2011 right so even factoring in 10 years of inflation right whereas yeah. now most most pubs will sell it for nine or ten dollars mm. um or you'd expect them to, um, that they were selling it for a lot more. And it was sort of like, for some reason, um, restaurateurs and bars um, and pubs, and et cetera, et cetera, they had this thing that Scotch whiskey needed to have a higher profit margin on it than your average beer. And I think if you if you knew any, any operators at that time, they would have said, yeah, we used to charge higher profit margin on, on uh, neat, on spirits that were going to be served neat. Mm, mm. Um, so that was probably the first thing that we did was say, well, hang on a tick. We want people to drink whiskey as though they drink a beer. And so we need to and make it. And it can be enjoyed on a, on, a, on a similar level as well. Right, exactly. Um, so why should we ping them for, um, for you know, more process of doing so? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So that was something that we just chucked out the window, right? If we're going to charge a certain margin on uh, on a beer, we'll start charge a certain margin on the on a whiskey, regardless of its price. That's that's quite admirable, and I think that's one of the reasons why uh, I guess you have such a repeat patronage as well, and you have such a like I, I know members, I know society members, as do you, uh, in Sydney, in Adelaide, in Perth, even who relish opportunity to fly over and spend some time at the bar. But, yeah. And that, that's, that's something you don't really see very often, uh, if at all. No, I, I think you're right. And uh, it's been shown, it's been reinforced to me in the last um, 60 days, 60 days since we closed the doors for COVID-19. Um, oh it's been reinforced by the amount of orders that we get from around the country, mm. um, it, which is just un unbelievable. And thank you to those people who have supported us over the last 60 days, because I was blown away, like the places that our customers come from. Like, <laughs> yeah, wow, unbelievable. Yeah, you were getting orders. I remember from even some of our members in some of our members as well in Tasmania and 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 Adelaide and whatnot, just being like, 
Well, I've got to get those juice bags. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. That's incredible. Uh, I'm going to grab, I'll just uh, quickly also just say, for those who missed the beginning of the stream, there's lots of people tuning in now. I'm chatting with Julian White, the co-founder of Whiskey and Ailment. Uh, we're talking about his journey. We're talking about the bar. We're talking about some history. And we'll talk a bit about the future as we go a little bit long tonight as well. Um, uh, one, there's a few questions that have come in. I just want to grab quickly here, including, uh, do you still make the Coco a go-go? <laughs> um, no, we don't. No. Okay. <laughs> well, I mean, it was worth asking. No, all good. Uh, can you tell us what Coco Go Go is? <laughs> um, I seem to remember that we used to do. And I don't think that was the exact name, but I, I seem to remember it might have been something with um, coffee, but with espresso and um, and fig jam potentially. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Sure. yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Um, uh, and of course, a lot of people saying, mm, love a bit of Overeem. Are you still having, you're still dreaming on that, aren't you, Jules? Yeah, mate. Yeah, still getting into it. Um, Darren says it's always a highlight to walk in not having visited for a while and ask M or Lockie what new stuff they've got to try. Always an experience and education. See, that's kind of something I want to touch on as well from Darren's comment there. It's not really a question. It's a comment. Uh, it's a very nice comment. It's it's something about, uh, I've, got to, I've got to say, I'm always amazed by the incredible, like, there's a feeling within the staff and the team that you seem to maintain uh, about there's, there's an enthusiasm for them, which follows your vision for it. Of course, you and Brooke's vision for it. Uh, how does that come about? What's, is it, I've seen you, I've been a part of, I've trained with you guys. I've been a part of those trainings as well, but there's surely another sort of fifth element to that, if you like. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really difficult question. <laughs> I think um, we've always sort of um, expected everyone to have had an experience with all the products on the bar. I know that might sound ridiculous to some people out there, but when you get 10 new products a week that might be $500 a bottle for three of them, um, mm. getting everyone to try that and have formed an opinion um, and be able to um, speak on that, on that particular uh, bottling um, pretty pretty difficult um, from a monetary point of view and also from a time uh, point of view. So that's always been our, our thing that when we get a, a new bottle in from day dot, it was always like, right, well, let's get the lid off it and let's, let's taste it together yeah. and have a talk about it. And so we still stand by that. Everyone tastes every bottle regardless of what it costs and how rare it is, you, 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 you taste it. Um, and then we, we always talk about it and, um, develop a our own um thoughts on it and as um as the turnover of new bottles has increased it's become more and more difficult but um it you know it's something that we stand by that everyone tries everything um but when it comes to um personalities at the bar um we don't hire people because they've worked at another whiskey bar because they've you know, being a tour guide at a particular distillery, whatever it might be, we, we hire purely on, on personalities. Um, so um, we're not, we're not going to hire someone because they've got good skills. We're going to hire them because we like them. Mm, yeah. You've, you've referenced that before. And I think that's a really good point to make. You're not looking for in great staff. You're not looking for whiskey nerds. You're looking, right. for, you know, you're looking for people who have good, good chat, people who you can get along with and, and make and make the whole service experience something else. Mm. Yeah, and, yeah. and that's obviously something you've developed over the years, and you and that's which is uh, which is what I was sort of touching on. That sort of it's an incredible sort of balance you've created there in the in the workforce, if you like, in the in the team. Thank you. I look, uh, the only thing I can say is I just treat everyone the way I want to be treated, and I, if I if I'm asking people to do something, I'm prepared to do it myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, that's awesome. Um, there's a uh, one of the questions I was going to ask, and someone's already asked it as well in the in the thread here about. Um, the never ending cask. So there's a never ending society cask at the bar, which is a one of its kind in the world still today, which I think is fantastic. Uh, yes, the vaults have the, uh, the living cask, uh, which is one cask of whiskey at a time. And, uh, and other society venues and bars have had, uh, have had uh, similar experiences. But in your case, you started with this. Can you give us some of the history of the never ending cask and what it is and where it started and, you, yeah, it's such you're a gonna have to reference. You're going to have to reference Chris Barnes in this one at least once. I will. I wish I had the photos ready. I'm sorry, I don't. No, no, I don't have them either. It's okay, but a question came up, but I may as well ask it. It was great. I wish I had them to share with you. Sorry. Um, so we might put them up afterwards, actually. Hold, hold me to that. So in, um, in, 20, 
in 2012, um, we were planning the transition into whiskey and ailment, and um, we want we we had Brooke and I had been to um, to Edinburgh and visited um, one of the partner bars that was there at the time. Um, had these incredible cigar boffies. I can't remember the name of it, and um, and we were like, wow, this society bar in a bar, as they knew it then, um, was was fantastic and you know we really wanted to be able to have that in Australia um, so we approached the society um, in Australia and Chris Barnes um, and said well what's going to make us different to any just bar in a bar how can we make it unique um, and so we thought well why, why can't we have um, a cask of whiskey in the bar um, that you know evolves with the bar um, and becomes almost Australianized uh, in the process um, so um, he said, well, you know what, I, I love the idea of having uh, another, you, you know, taking the society to, to the public in a, in a controlled way uh, and in a way that presents it properly. I think that was the biggest difficulty for, for you know, getting society into, into, um, into the public's eye. And um, so we... Uh, we started talking about the cask and he was like, yeah, this sounds great. Solero um, thing would really appeal to him being a, uh, a lecturer in uh, at Melbourne University in the uh, in, in, in wine. Yeah, he's, and, like, he's a big wine buff. Absolutely. Oh, incredible wine buff. Um, so he said, yep, look, I'll sort out the cask. Um, let's get some whiskey over. What do you want it to be like? Oh, we want an Isla. We want a, you know, big ballsy and it needs to be affordable to start off with if we're going to be buying bulk of it and chucking it in a cask that could go wrong um <laughs> and uh and he's like yeah, yeah all right we'll get that get that organized so he calls me up in uh in november 2012 and says i've, I've got the cask ready um what do you want to do with it I said, well let's see let's we need to season it you know um so we went i i haven't i don't know if i've mentioned this before but um, I went around to his house and I've got photos at this point, up, um, which I wish I had for you, but um, we were around there and um, filled the cask with, uh, what would it have been? Probably would have made about six or seven flagons of um, McWilliams um, medium uh, apera. And- <laughs> Aussie sherry, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we filled it up with that. And uh, meanwhile, his dog was watching on and uh, Chris, Chris Barnes always has a lovely dog that goes with him everywhere. Um, so the dogs in the photos is great. And, um, and so that's where that started. And we let that, we let that season for uh, a couple of months. And on St. Andrew's Day in 2012, we filled it with um, a 33. Um, so yeah, that was 33, very, very cool. <laughs> yeah. do, you remember, do you remember the code on that 33 at all? Oh, uh, I think it was, I think it might've been called goodbye to care, um, right, right. which is exactly what we did. We just sort of, and we did it on the, so the, the society used to store their, uh, all their stock down in Melbourne, uh, in Port Melbourne. And uh, that's where we were going to store the cast for those first few months. And so we literally just filled up, emptied all these bottles of 33 into this freshly seasoned, uh, we, we poured that we poured this the, the, the seasoning sherry onto the lawn onto the nature strip and then up and then unceremoniously emptied you know all these bottles of 33 uh into the cask it was it was amazing and so it sat in uh in McPhee's there for uh a couple of a few months uh in their storage facility before we uh before we opened the whiskey and ailment uh in february 2013 that's incredible that's that's a proper piece of like I love the fact that you got a you just <laughs> filling the cask with a thirty three, which yeah. <laughs> just even today you'd just be like if if you did that today it'd be like that's absurd. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm just gonna ha I'm just gonna bring this up for everyone to see just a bit of context here. Um, here we go. That's it. That's the one. <laughs> so it was a seven year old thirty three dot one one eight goodbye to care. That uh, was some quick. Con Quick scouting there, I found that one, but that's going back a bit, of course, that cask. Yeah, it sure is. And uh, so the, one of the questions that came through on the stream here was, um, uh, yeah, how do you top it up? So these days, how do you maintain it? What do you, like, how does that work? So um, you and I work pretty, uh, pretty closely on, um, on, on looking for 
um, a cask that is already approved by panel and bottled by panel back in Scotland. Uh, and I sort of say, well, the cask's starting to taste a, a little bit like this. It's going in that direction. Um, so if we could have something that, you know, has a bit more wood profile, um, generally what seems to be happening to the cask these days is that um, it, it can become quite salty for some reason. I don't know why. Um, becomes quite salty. Um, so Overly we, coastal almost. Yeah, yeah. That, okay. that coastal Russell Street air. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, um, you know, quite often the brief is to sort of counteract what's going on and in which direction the cask is going because my my vision is that, you know, if it's going in a particular direction, it might not stop going in that mm -hmm. direction. So we want to start steering it back the other way. Um, so uh, when it comes to physically filling it, we and and yeah, yeah. And, and in it goes. Um, that, that's all that happens. I remember when you were filling it. Uh, I think the second last time you were doing it. Um, oh, have we lost him? I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. Okay. <laughs> well, the second last time you were filling the um the cask, you sent me some photos for us to use on social media, and they're all strategically held like this. The yeah. ball going in. <laughs> Like, oh, that's, that's what's going in that one right there. <laughs> we are um, proud of what goes in there. I suppose the reason for that is, is just so that, you know, it's a surprise always. And uh, I think that's the beauty of the cask is that every time you come back to the bar, it'll be different and yeah. it's evolving. And, you know, it's, it's still got a bit of that 33 in it uh, and it's, it's had some new heads in it recently um, and, and that's influenced it in a massive way. And so... Yeah. It, it's, it's all about sort of just taking all those little pieces and going, well, what's going to be next and which way do we want it to go? Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Um, coming back to our, our questions. Um, so you've talked a bit about the, the sort of the last 10 years of whiskey appreciation scene. If you like, it's something that, as you said, it was a, 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 a trial and error of persistence in a way. It's something that you've grown. You've seen bars, uh, pop up around Melbourne, uh, that have almost, uh, come off the back of what what you created uh which has to be something somewhat humbling as well to see and uh sydney siders constantly say how much um they envy the whiskey scene in melbourne and what what's been created down there uh, myself included um so where do you see what would you see as, as then the next 10 years look like from here so we're celebrating the 10th anniversary of whiskey and Almond this year where would you see the next 10 years look like for you uh not just for whiskey and Almond, but for the um I guess for the, the broader whiskey appreciation, what do you see changes or uh, improvements or where it could be better or what, what could be next? Yeah, uh, it's a really great question. And, and one that's, you know, been dialing around in, uh, in Brooke and I's um, mind, particularly over the last sort of 60 days, um, you know, with the way things are, are, are changing in the, uh, the huge um, involvement that people are having in online tastings and, you know, catching up with their mates um, at home uh, and, and whether or not you think it's uh, something that's temporary or not um, is, is something that's certainly, um, you know, in, in our minds. But I think that there's still so much, it's, it's very difficult to make discoveries um, at home um, without having someone planting suggestions in your mind that you don't always know. Some of the greatest um, suggestions and drams that I've stumbled upon and whiskey experiences I've stumbled upon are from people who I didn't know I was going to meet, didn't plan to meet, um, making those suggestions, putting things in front of me and saying, well, you know what, here's your opportunity. And that, that has sort of been something that's, you know, changed me. I'm sure it's changed heaps of people. Uh, and if you, I think we generally want to be exploratory. Um, people do. They want to go and find things. They want to go and search for something. Uh, and and doing that, you know, through the internet only can only take you so far. Um, so I think that. Um, I mean, I'd, love be, I'd love to be talking to you in person right now. That's that's for sure. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I think that that can only take you so far. Um, it has huge. Um, huge ploys for distribution and availability, which we've just experienced. But I think still, you know, bars are going to be really important. Um, 
But when it comes to the appreciation of whiskies, however you get your hands on them or however you find them, I think that people are going to um, still be looking for new flavours. And I, I, I foresee that the likes of, um, you know, malt brands that have their standard expressions, I see them having to diversify um, from their, you know, core ranges. A li- you know, they're going to have to start doing that um, soon because um, the, the, there's all these, you know, new um, products, you know, constantly being sort of put in people's faces um, all the time. And I think that, that they're going to start taking over from, from you know, your standard 12-year-old single malt whiskey that, you know, is $48 a bottle. I think that, you know, soon enough, there'll be a recipe out there to create a new $48 bottle, a new $48 expression as often. Yeah, right. So it could be, it could be sort of like diversification of like craft whiskey, for lack of a better phrase, uh, even on the lower end could, could start to sort of infiltrate, if you like, or change how people appreciate whiskey and how they buy it. Yeah, hundred percent. I, I think I, that's that's the way I, I see it. That that people uh, are not going to be drinking. You know, back in the day, it was just like, do you drink Carlton Draft or do you drink VB? And that yeah, was yeah. right. And you you were you only drank that. It was VB uh, for me. But yeah, right. there you go. Um, so I, I think that that's only going to be a, a, a vision of the past, and that, that we're always going to be searching for that new product all the time and and have it available as well yeah right yeah and that's and like i mean we're even seeing that i guess in some regards there was a i can't remember where it's being made it's like an irish as an irish whiskey i think but it's not a whiskey it's a it's a lab grown one it's like a glyph glyph is that the glyph yeah sorry that's the one is that it's even i don't even know if it's irish but it's i thought Uh, it's it's lab whiskey yeah 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 (laughs) Next dram. Why not? Why not? Okay, you're on 68. Where am I up to? I'm going to have a tiny bit more Armagnac, but then I'll, I'll move across. Very well. Okay. While we're, uh, while we're talking about the uh, the new whiskeys of the future. future I, uh, whiskey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd like to put a shout out to um, Al Bay because I think that they are... Uh, That's very cool. Yeah. The boundaries, mate. And... Uh, I love where that brand's going. Yeah, no, me too. And I think it's, I, I, at first I wouldn't even, it's almost, I wouldn't even call it a distillery in some ways. Uh, It is. What do you mean? I'd say it's like, it's like a replication facility. They can create anything there. It's it's a distillery, but it's also like, it's, it's like a, um, uh, what Darren Howie says, and as an interstater ex Melbourneian, uh, he lives up in Cairns. Uh, I'd love to see Whiskey and Element doing online tasting slash masterclass type events tasting similar to the in-house ones where you could buy a Japanese or space side tasting pack and have it sent out and join six to eight people on Zoom run by the Whiskey and Element guys or Matt Lowell. There you go. <laughs> Funny you should ask. Um, we, uh, <laughs> we, uh, we did just very successfully do our first um, guest presenter tasting last night on uh, last night, a couple of nights ago. Um, with Ben Riak, with um, Stuart Buchanan. Uh, we sent the drams out beforehand and everybody tuned in and, uh, you know, Stuart presented the whiskies and uh, we went and threw it out to some questions as well. Yeah. Which, um, mostly my questions, I might add, but... Um, <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, we've got more in the pipeline. So, yeah, keep, keep your eyes out. Yeah, very cool. Darren, it's the same for us. As you know, we had our May virtual and we've got our June virtual. We're trying to do one a month at the moment. You'd be surprised how much of a production it is, as I'm sure uh, Jules going to attest to uh, squeezing whiskey into juice bags. But um, <laughs> I don't even know how you get it in that bag, to be honest. I have no idea. <laughs> Would you like to know? Yeah, tell us, tell us. How do you, how you get it? Like, I see that li- the little spout and, and the, the movement on them. I'm like, how did you free, do you free pour into it? Uh, so our lovely staff have the, uh, have the, the difficult... Uh, strenuous time of uh, filling those. We, we have, you know, those um, camping... Our air pumps that you pump up your lilo with yeah got one of those little nozzle on it and we puff the bags up uh, with that and then uh and then we syringe um the uh the whiskeys in there so 30 uh, mils at a time or what it, it, it just 15 mil syringes yeah right is there such a thought could you get a 30 mil one that'd save your time oh, i haven't found one yet <laughs> how many people needing 30 mil syringes of anything i guess i don't know i'm sure they're out there for horses or something like that 
Jonathan suggests that it's done motherbird style, dram in the mouth, then into the bag. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's the one. <laughs> um, Darren says, can't wait till, until the 30th. Uh, Darren, yes, you can because it's the 29th. Don't be a day late for it, Darren. It's the 29th. <laughs> um, let me grab some of the questions. Uh, let me grab some. Of the, let me go back to the question. Sorry. Um, there was something you said which has resonated with me. Now, you said this a good. I'm going to go three years ago, okay. uh, maybe two or three years ago, maybe two, but possibly three years ago. Uh, you and I were on it. No, it was two years ago. Well, you and I were on a panel together on the Winter Holder stage at Good Food, uh, yeah. the Good Food, Good Food and Wine Festival. Uh, there was something you said about how you'd like whiskey as a category to be one day as uh, diversely orderable, for lack of a better phrase, diversely orderable. Uh, like if you're sitting in business class on a plane and remember if everyone here remembers what plane rides were, they, they did exist up until two months ago. But um, if you're sitting on a, if sitting in business class, for instance, and they ask you, would you like a, you ask, would you like a red wine? Would you like a, a glass of wine? And you say, you say yes. And then they say, oh, would you like a, a red? Uh, what kind of red would you like? Or what kind of white would you like? And they've got three or four different red wines and three or four different white wines. You'd like eventually even uh, on that level for, you said at the time, whiskey appreciation for for uh, to be as accessible as that in whiskey, rather than oh, you can have um, Red Label or Jack Daniels. Yeah, I, I, I really I hear it all the time when I go because I, I don't drink very much table wine, uh, and so when you go to you know a, a pretty standard venue uh, and people say, oh, can I have a glass of red? What reds have you got open? Uh, and they'll go, oh yeah, we've got a Cab, we've got a Shiraz, and we've got a Pinot. Uh, and that's expected, you know, if you go to a pub and with your meal, they don't offer three different varietals, you go, oh, this pub shit. Whereas, you know, if you, it, wouldn't it be great if you could go to a whiskey, to, to a pub and say, oh, I'll, I'll have a whiskey to go with my, uh, my roast beef, please. Um, and they say, sure, would you like an Isla? Would you like, you know, something heavily sherried or would you like, you know. Or something- even to the point of saying, oh, these, these nine whiskeys here go really well with roast beef. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> why not? I think I think you know while it might seem a little bit over the top at the moment. Well, how did wine get to that? You know. Yeah. They went, well, we we want to be seen as something that's um, got this diversity, and you should be able to order it. So let's 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 train people to do that, and let's ask that of venues. Uh, and so yeah, that's I think that'd be really cool. That's a, that's a it's a matter of venue culture in a way as well, isn't it? It's about uh, you know, right. treating it as a, as a, as a, as as you've done with whiskey and helmet, as a drink that can be enjoyed in a variety of circumstances, and isn't it doesn't carry a luxury penalty because it's not beer. Mm. Yeah, and that's the exciting part. I mean, that's like it's how it's a, how it's perceived and and how it's uh, read in market rather than just as a um uh, that one little tipple at the end of of your meal or something. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and you see, we see a lot of that, of course. Um, uh, but. That's, I hope that changes as well. Yeah. Um, so let's let's talk a little bit as well. Let's get dig a bit deeper whilst we're heading into the last part here. Um, you and Brooke have been quite clued in uh, in the Australian whiskey scene as well. Not just, of course, the Melbourne bar scene and the Melbourne whiskey appreciation scene, but the um, the Australian whiskey scene. You've seen a lot of what's happened there. You've seen the growth of that scene over the last ten years. You've seen, and you're probably already looking at the future of it as well which is kind of my question for you. Like given it's just sort of, as we talk, talked about with whiskey and almond, the last 10 years and the next 10, what mm-hmm. challenges and opportunities do you see for the Australian whiskey scene in the next few years then? Uh, look, I think I've seen the, the transition into um, using larger casks and casks with less, inf- like less previous fill influence. Um, being used a lot better and that that transitions happened a lot quicker than I expected. Um, and also the, 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 the steering away from every release from a, uh, from distilleries being single cask bottlings, single cask is a very, very, you know, it's an anomaly in a way that, that you could um, select a single cask and release it. Not something that you go, oh, damn, we're out of um, port expressions today. Let's go find another one. Like, no, no, it doesn't no. work that way. It should, it should hit you right where you live when you taste it. Go, whoa, that's something stand out. And, 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 and so, yeah, I think that 
making these small batches that they're doing really quickly, like they're, they're pivoting really fast to, to get into making small batches out of these casks, uh, really great. So when it comes to the future though, I think that a lot of distilleries are, um, are gonna start working on um, using the different grains uh, really well. And we've already seen the likes of Archie Rose, um, Ned, um, and also- Ned. Yeah, Ned, Ned are going to be stepping into the, uh, the, the the variation in grains as well. That's very cool. I, it's a story yeah. I know nothing about, I'll be honest. Yeah. Um, tune in for another time. Um, and yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, other distilleries, are you, and like, like um, for instance, uh, the gospel um, guys are re working really, really well with, with different types of grain. And um, I think- Very solid, very solid straight rye out of them as well. Oh, shit. So yeah, yeah, it's very it's solid. Really um, so yeah, I think that diversification um, away from just doing single malt Scotch style whiskey in single yeah. cask format, that's going to be the way of the future. Um, so what, look, I'm not in a big production game, so I don't, I don't really know. Um, but um, I certainly have um, appreciated watching the changes that have happened over the last 12 months. That's for sure. Yeah, it is quite rapid. And it's, it's something that when on our, um, our round table, Last Friday night with um, with Bill Lark and Casey Overham and John Jarvis and 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 Jane Overham as well. Um, one of the discussion points was that is sort of that the ancient era, if you like, and I'd say that you know eighteen twenty to nineteen fifties nineteen sixties production, and then the the modern era, which is ninety two with Cradle Mountain and Lark etc., and then uh, the next era, which is sort of like twenty fourteen onwards. And I'd say 2014 to almost 2020 is an interesting year of, in Australian whiskey in itself. I say 2014 specifically because of the award that Sullivan's picked up uh, mm. and put Australian whiskey a lot on the map for a lot of people. Right. I think, I think we have actually entered the next year in some ways. And we're seeing, uh, well, if I'm to quote Duckett's famous price correction, we're seeing a bit of uh, update on that. And we're seeing, uh, I think a lot of distilleries finally paying attention a bit more to their spirit. And, they're, um, and I, that was just something I thought from a bar level and from a development level of someone who's bottled your own whiskeys including your double cask sullivans and mm. uh, and things like that that's the, that's the next step i guess in is is in spirit development yeah yeah it is um i, I was really uh wowed at the the way that um the guys at the gospel um were producing their spirit um i've never seen anything like it and the spirit that came out the other end was was testament to trial and error uh, I think uh, I've never seen uh, a mash move into um, move into sorry I've never seen a, a wash move into a still at the, this rate yeah oh, really <laughs> and because this so because they just still on grain um, you can actually see the particles of of husk um, and particles of grain moving through the watch glass into the uh, into the into the still and it moves like that it's like clag <laughs> and so <laughs> like that just to me yeah. just seems like an issue like it seems like a really big problem is about to happen so i really uh really appreciated their, their perseverance um with that and um yeah yeah indeed and, and taking the leap especially with um with releasing you know to what is a bourbon market here in australia and, yeah. and primarily you know bourbon that people drink here they don't really give two hoots about what it tastes like on its own um, to, to really take on that market in a way that is flavor first. Um, yeah. I find that, that really interesting as well. And yeah. It's funny you mentioned that I had a, I had a, um, almost like a, a, a staffed catch up uh, at SMWS uh, with a special guest speaker a few nights back with Dr. Sam Simmons. And um, he was saying that he, this movement in, especially in Scotland about this flavor first movement, if, if you like, um, where, talking about like ambassadors talking about things like uh, you know, barley strains and yeast varietals and wash temperatures doesn't really tell you anything about the whiskey. And thankfully we've seen, we've seen this movement uh, uh, moving towards uh, being a bit more sort of conscious of flavor and in production and in, and in conversation as well, which, which you've, which I, I'm remarking because that's what you've done upstairs at Melbourne whiskey room with the menu. I noticed uh, by dividing the whiskies into flavor categories, uh, even someone like myself, and I know a lot of what's on that menu, I still I can still look at it and go, ah, okay, I can now judge on what I am in the mood for. 
it's a mood based decision rather than a uh, well logical. I need to box tick that that whiskey or whatever. Yeah, that wasn't actually designed for people who already know whiskey. Um, that menu was designed for people who go who who attend that that venue because their friends like whiskey. Um, and but even I found that useful, and I know whiskey, and I found that useful. Uh, look, the, well, that's the silver lining then. That's fantastic. I'm, oh, I'm hugely, so because I, it's the end of the night for me. It was the end of the night for me. It was sort of like I just hosted an event. Oh, I knew what I was in the mood for, but I wasn't. Yeah. I wasn't in the. I wasn't like I'm not in the mood to pick something out and go. Mm, which cask is that, and which one was sit, sat there, and which warehouse did that one come from? I was in the mood for. I'm in the mood for something sweet, fruity, and mellow. I'm in the mood for something well in coastal, whatever the descriptors were. It was like, oh, I know what I'm in the mood for now. Yeah, I think it was just an ease of use choice, to be honest with you. Like, easier yeah. to use the menu rather than sort of. We used to see people get picking up the menu and just flicking pages, going, "Oh, where do I start?" Yeah, exactly. They, yeah, they, they they didn't know where to start, and so if you can start with something they do know, like I feel like something floral, clean, and uh, and malt driven, then yeah, here they are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very cool. Uh, there was one other question coming through here, which was, um, uh, ooh, where am, am I going to, I think I may have lost that one. That's okay. Ah, oh, Ian asks, uh, what are the plans or any future plans for the Melbourne whisk for the whiskey room upstairs? I think it's just a general comment about any, any sort of future plans for that room. Um, I can tell you now that, um, you know, if, and when, uh, Melbourne whiskey room does reopen on Friday and Saturday nights, I, I have no idea when that might be just at the moment. Um, but um, currently the back bar upstairs um, is completely empty of bottles. Um, they've all been moved um, to the space downstairs. Right. And, um, so there's going to be at least one, one bar there that gets a completely new collection. Very cool. Very cool. Um, Joel Rinaldi says, uh, I think we're also going to see a lot more affordable, quaffable style, quaffable type whiskeys from Australian distilleries something you can just enjoy neat or on the rocks around a hundred dollars. E.g. Archie Rose, Rye, Starwood Twofold, Whippersnapper, Upshot, Lime Burners, Dugite to be released soon, things like that. Yeah. Oh, I couldn't agree more. And I think it's great. You know, they've all sort of, as I said about Ailsa Bay before, you know, they've, they've hit that hundred dollar mark. Um, they're, they're sort of doing a big batch, like that 1.2 that's been around for a long time now, but I feel like, that's going to evolve. Um, and and yeah. even still, they've got Airstone as well, mm. which, um, you know, has its three flavor camps um, as well. So it's, it's flavor first. Yeah, 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 yeah. I saw those Airstones recently. I didn't know much about them, but I'll have to do a bit more research on that. Mm. Um, great comment there, Joel. Um, you're on the A5.1, are you? Yeah. Remind me what the proof is on that one. Because I remember it being quite brutal. <laughs> 61.3. For, oh, how you get 61.3% out of a single distillation uh, baffles me. And, and it's, there was another one. There was an A5.2 that was around 62.1 or something as well. Uh, and it was like, a, it was, yeah, because that, that one I've been enjoying right now is 47.9, which makes sense for Armagnac being single distillation. And, and uh, often don't, you'd often don't see cast strength Armagnac at ridiculous proofs. So 61 point something is always... Um, yeah, yeah. I, don't know how they, I don't know how that distillery does it. Um, I think it's got to do with their the rectifier um, in the in the still setup. That probably you know they can close plates, open plates, whatever it might be to to yeah. uh, to dial it up like that. But um, the thing I particularly love about this bottling um, is that it's, it it says a single grape variety uh, on it, and which is something that only a Munyak could do. Um, yeah, yeah, Munyak, it has to be. A variety um so the uh the uh Armagnac with just colombard um grapes in it is really really interesting um for me and uh, the, the, another thing i love telling people about this bottling um is that it, the the cask says gaskin black oak um now gaskin is where uh these Armagnac producers are and the black oak um tends to be i've heard from a few uh Armagnac producers and people that live on the estates there and they said oh yeah the black oak that's probably just a tree that was growing on the on the estate there, and uh, a big storm came one day and knocked it over, and so they they cut <laughs> it up and made it into casks, <laughs> and that's where the whiskey's been in. 
<laughs> but that's kind of cool though that it's it's a tree from the estate right yeah it's like it's not like some commercial sort of like uh cooperage kind of situation here it's like the, the it wasn't like staves from space like cooperage coming through it was like this is this is legit that, that's actually quite cool though yeah uh, another great um great one i hear about about french oak is that um the, i'm sorry if this is not news to anyone but um the reason that there's so much great french oak around is that um the the french government all, all back into the uh uh 18th and 19th century they had um the forestry guards I, I can't remember the french term for it but they had a guard of the forest it was like a full-on political board um that um that presided over the planting and protection of trees and when they were to be harvested throughout forests in france um it might have even gone back further than the uh, 18th century but um, and it was, it, we, we now are reaping the rewards of this incredible, you know, 150, 200 year old oak um, for making casks, but that's not what it was designed for. It wasn't designed for climate change either. It was designed for and carbon capture. It was designed for making um, ships um, and for, for masts and boats and stuff like that. Yeah. And so, and now that we don't need wooden boats anymore, they, they've gone, right, well, let's make some casks out of it, Jimmy. Um, and yeah, there you go, Jimmy. <laughs> hey, old, Jimmy. Old, old mate. <laughs> Nicholas Music asks, and I'm going to rephrase his question a little bit here. Um, he asks, uh, "What is uh, if?" Well, I'm going to rephrase it a little bit. Uh, if you had to pick one, what is Julian's favorite flavor profile? And I assume he means the the twelve flavor profiles of society. But you can uh, you can answer that either way. It's like, what well, if you had to pick one? You were stuck with it. I guess it's your favorite. What's your favorite flavor profile? If you're like me, you like to bounce around flavor profiles depending on mood and feeling and night of the week. But for you, what would it be? Yeah, I think um, it seems to be every time I accrue a decade in age, my flavor profiles change. When I was in my uh, in my late teens, it was rum. I really loved rum. And then it turned into whiskey in my 20s. And then in my 30s, I kind of got into the nitty gritty whiskey flavors that I really like. Um, and now um, the, the flavor profile that I really love, it's been a few years uh, now that I've been enjoying it, is... Um, really extensively matured um, um, single malt whiskies that have, um, you know, sort of like 20, 30 years on them that have very low amounts of colour and low amounts of oak influence in them. So they've just had that really reductive character um, and the sweetness is sort of concentrated without, without taking lots of tannins. Uh, and if it happened to have a dash of satan on the end of it, uh, I would love that. Um, <laughs> Matt, Matt knows all about it, actually. I if you order something out of a menu, he goes, oh, that's definitely a Jules whiskey. Yeah. <laughs> I like to think, I like to think, and this is for real, I do like to think that I can look at a whiskey menu and go, that's a Jules whiskey, or an outturn and go, I reckon Jules would dig that one. And I can also look at that same outturn and go, that's a Brook whiskey, if I've ever seen one. I know, I know, I know what each of you like quite well, I think, in flavor profile. But um, it, so I guess you could say it's almost like a... Uh, Maybe an old aged spicy and dry profile then or something like that with a bit of uh, not not overly uh, not overly tannic, not overly sort of sweet, but like like you say, a long aged refill cask. It's it's had a bit of had a bit of time and and um that's that I, I completely know where you're coming from with that. Yeah. Um I, I, they don't come about all that often. Uh, I had a ripper a little while ago, a John Milroy's frisky whiskey. Um, it was a 20 year old Linkwood. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. It was at fifty six percent, but it tasted like lime jelly. It was it was so soft. Yet yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just incredible. <laughs> a very old school profile, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, totally. Uh, Steve Oates says, "Is anybody drinking a beer?" No, Steve. No one's drinking beer. Sorry, not yet. But we'll, we'll, we'll maybe I'll crack open a um some wacky sort of cherry stout thing to to keep you happy later. Sorry. Um, good to uh, look. Really appreciate all the great questions that have been coming through. Uh, all, all the chat that I've had with you tonight and all the years that we've had together um, talking great whiskey, hosting great whiskey and being involved with the SMWS and Whiskey and Ailment. Thank you so much. Uh, Georgia DeBiazzi says, that sounds a lot like 39.174. I don't know 39.174 off the top of my head. We get a lot of lovely 39s through, but I'll, Georgia, I'll have to look that up. Uh, Jules, thank you so much for coming on tonight. Thanks for having us. No, I really, really, really appreciate it. And um, yeah, I that we've um, we've been able to catch up virtually. I, I think we we probably had a few uh, events penned in for this year that you know 
are, are certainly going to be pushed back. So we're, we're long overdue, mate. At, at least half a dozen we had booked in. And, and yeah. I, I, I completely appreciate the situation that uh, you're doing. And, I, and I, I love what you guys are doing. And you have our full support always, as I've said. Um, yeah. uh, Ian Scott says, thanks, guys. Looking forward to getting back into Whiskey and Helmet for a dram or three. As am I, Ian. I'm, I promise you I'm going to be the first one sitting on the bar stools around the, around the bar there the moment I can. Um, thank you, everyone, so much for tuning in tonight, um, for, having, for listening to myself and Jules talk whiskey, have a chat, and be involved with it all and some of your history and some of the bar's history and some of the future. That's what tonight was all about. That's the end of our um, interviews for the week, if you like. Um, the next one, of course is tomorrow night, which is the members zoom uh, Friday night. The classic Friday night members catch up is back again tomorrow night, which I'm really excited about. Um, so everyone can tune into the zoom channel. The link will be in our SNWS Australia Facebook group. So jump on that link tomorrow, 7 PM onwards. I promise it won't go for four hours. Like it did last time. That was a bit much, but you know, it'll, it might go for a little while and uh, I won't feel so fatigued on Saturday morning. If it doesn't go that long, thank you everyone so much. Thank you, Jules. And we'll see you all soon. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Jules, don't go anywhere. I'll see you soon.